I've talked a lot about the Athenian Empire on this channel, but I'll also be the first to admit that putting into perspective the political, military, and economic dominance of just one city over most of Greece is really hard. It's especially hard to quantify when most of Athens' power came not from land, but from the sea, so bear with me here. It's no secret that Athens had a cartoonish amount of money tucked away in their treasury for most of the 5th century BC, on account of those guys having extortion down to a science. For the most part, the Parthenon serves as the definitive-ish symbol of Athenian power, a giant, elegant, and brilliant monument to Athena and, by extension, to Athens itself. But I offer you the possibility that there's something far more quintessentially, emblematically Athenian and indicative of Athenian power than anything else. And it happens to be almost 30 miles away from the Parthenon. It's the Temple of Poseidon at Sunium. Both mythologically and historically, Cape Sunio, which is at the southern tip of Attica, has been a central part of Athenian heritage and identity for centuries. It was supposedly the site where the Athenian king Aegeus threw himself into the Aegean Sea when his son Theseus was too busy getting hammered after successfully playing Matador with the Minotaur to change the sails on his ship. And even Homer, who notably says very little about Athens, mentions in the Odyssey that Cape Sunio was sacred to the Athenians. More practically, the silver mines at Lavrio, where the Athenians mined all of the silver that paid for their fleet of ships in the Second Persian War, are just five miles northeast of Sunio. So bottom line is it's a really important location to Athens. And as such, there's been stuff on and around Sunio for a good long while. Even before the Athenian Empire in the 400s BC, the Cape was home to a temple that dated back to at least the 700s BC. And we don't really know all that much about that one, because the Persians wrecked it in 480 when their navy was on its way to get unceremoniously destroyed at the Battle of Salamis. In the 40 years before its replacement was built, Athens proceeded to build up its navy and sweep up all of the Aegean islands into its cool best friends club, aka Oppressive Empire. And even in the 40 years between temples, Athens had a critically important use for the Cape. Greek geography is many things, but convenient for Athens to run a naval empire is most definitely one of them. In the imperial days, Sunio functioned as the perfect lookout post, since it has direct sightlines from the Aegean Sea all the way to the Peloponnese. The Athenians could see every single ship in at least a 15 mile radius, and that is huge. Now you may rightly ask, well, why not just avoid sailing there, but the problem is, you couldn't really. See, in ancient times, all sailors got from place to place by sailing close to the coasts of islands in the mainland because venturing into open water was objectively terrifying all the way up until at least the 1800s. If you're curious, you can check out my video on the Vikings for a longer explanation of maritime navigation. In a Greek context, this meant that anyone who wanted to go into or out of the Aegean Sea had no choice but to sail right past Attica and right in front of Cape Sunio. At that point, with a navy like the Athenians, any ship that passed into or out of the Aegean did so because Athens allowed them. From one tiny hill on the tip of Attica, they could exercise an astounding level of control over a vast majority of Greek maritime travel. From there, owning almost every Aegean island doesn't seem like so much of a stretch. They all depended on waterways for trade and resources, and Athens controlled the waterways. So they in turn depended on Athens, and Athens in turn controlled all of them. It was a self-perpetuating cycle that started with Sunio and ended with this gigantic mess of blue here. And remember, Athenian silver came from nearby Lavrio, and that silver paid for the navy. So pretty much the heart of Athenian naval power sat in Sunio, and it demanded a suitably kick-ass temple to go along with it. The temple that we know today was built in the 440s, around the same time as the Parthenon, because the Athenian statesman Pericles loved building stuff. Much like the Parthenon, Sunio was built with marble mined from a mountain northeast of Athens. That's not too bad for the Parthenon, but to drag all that junk the 30 miles down to Sunio is a little ridiculous. You don't haul that much marble across that big a distance unless you are on a mission. So simply getting the materials for this thing, even though it's only about half the size of the Parthenon, would have been a colossal undertaking. Structurally speaking, the temple is, or mostly was, beautiful. It's a little rough around the somewhat non-existent edges today, but if you want to know what it would have looked like, it's nearly identical to an Athenian temple to Hephaestus, which miraculously is almost entirely intact. Like, seriously, what? 
This is incredible and almost no one knows about it. Anyway, while we're appreciating the pretty marble, one of my favorite details about the construction of classical Greek temples has to do with the columns. From the Parthenon, we've learned that the pretty fluting on the columns was carved after the perfectly cylindrical sections of marble were assembled, which itself was done rather ingeniously. To assemble a column in the first place, the Athenians cut out a square peg into each of the marble cylinders, so that a small wooden block could be placed there to guide the marble into perfect alignment. And that wasn't all. The tops of the cylinders were so finely machined that, one, the gaps between sections of columns were practically invisible to the eye, but also, two, no air could get between the cylinders, so when we pulled apart the Parthenon's columns, we found the wood from 2,500 years ago still completely intact. And if 0% wood erosion isn't crazy, then I don't know what is. These builders really knew what they were doing. So, it was both a really pretty temple and an incredible feat of engineering, all sitting atop the Athenian viewing post to the entire world and the heart of its naval supremacy, but there's one more thing to its uniquely Athenian awesomeness. To continue beating this poor dead comparison horse, the Parthenon functioned as somewhat of a mirror for Athenian society. All of Athens could look up to the sky and see their brilliant accomplishment, but it was special in that only Athenians, or the occasional visitors to Athens, would ever see it. Broadly speaking, it existed to inspire pride within Athens. However, Sunio wasn't in Athens, and a fair number of Athenians probably never saw it. But you know who did see it? Pretty much every single sailor who passed into or out of the Aegean Sea. Everyone who knew the water knew that Athens and Athens alone owned it. Perhaps the most striking detail that lies hidden in plain sight is how the temple was dedicated to Poseidon. Now, to my eyes, Athens is making quite a statement here. Essentially, it's telling all passers-by that if you so dare to screw with us, we will be the Poseidon to your Odysseus, and we will ruin you. So, uh, remember who's boss, okay? Athens is directly putting itself and its control over the sea on the same level as the god Poseidon. Now that is what projecting power looks like. So, basically, though my love for the Parthenon knows very few bounds, I believe that Sunio is a monument that much more deeply represents what Athens and, by extension, the Athenian Empire fundamentally were all about. Unrivaled maritime power. And holy crap, the sunsets there are really pretty. <laughs>